Modern science uses logic to cast aside notions like deity and soul. The classic example being the theory of a Big Bang. Basically, all material substance in the universe came from nothing in a single instant, and then that raw material eventually woke up and became sentient and aware of itself. This is the essence of the matter before mind hypothesis, and it is the current established theory that the world agrees on. However, it doesn't take a superior intellect to see that what we just described is unavoidably two miracles in a row, each one of the two paradoxically more impossible than the other. The esoteric and theistic world, however, is not known for its use of logic when attempting to explain this primary enigma. Mythology, occult philosophy, and every religious sect to ever cover this topic agree that an eternal, never-born mind exists as the foundation of all things. When it thinks, those thoughts entwine and emanate so powerfully that they become dense and occur to the universe as matter. This being said, there is no need to explain the second part of our conundrum that is matter waking up, because we indicate that the tangible matter is dreamt of, so to speak, by this eternal unborn mind. This is the essence of the mind before matter hypothesis, and it doesn't take a superior intellect to see that this inverted version of the above notion requires far less so-called miracles to take place. In fact, if we consider the frightening fact that we have no idea what consciousness is in the first place, it requires approximately 100% less miracles than the current established theory. So, which proponent of these two theories require having to carry the burden of proof title on its back? One might even go as far as to say that the word logic that we so enjoy flinging around while assuming that a human brain even has the capacity to taste its own tongue should find its home much more comfortably in our second mind before matter hypothesis. In other words, it just makes more sense any which way you try to twist it. But it is pushed back on by science for one simple reason. It requires a god. Or does it? The anthropomorphic fallacy is a term coined to illustrate the illusion that God is a bearded man in the clouds. We all know better, of course. But as strange as it sounds, the more and more closely we look at it, this anthropomorphic fallacy is indeed the essential reason that modern science pushes back so vehemently against the mind before matter hypothesis. Without this ignorant assumption, science could move forward with our second inverted notion, consider Considering that quantum science is leading our stubborn textbook thinking horses of science head first into the realization of reality being more of a dream than a mechanism. It's time to drink that water now more than ever, because that water is the life of meaning, the purpose of which we are so bereft. So what causes the whole anthropomorphic fallacy in the first place? Well, besides the obvious fact that religious leaders who have had no direct spiritual gnosis always want the God that they preach of to look like them in a feeble attempt to be the one and only authority on the God subject, the source of religious information is both the result of fragmentation and rough interpretation. Basically, language on paper. It is in pieces that need gaps filled in, translations that can be messy, and interpretations that are always subject to corruption. They will tell you it means this or that in order to push their own conclusions, assumptions, and fulfillment of power. Codices are tampered with by ego across the board, but the symbolic petroglyphs and geometric megaliths are in stone. Stone that contains a message that could survive the test of time, making it all the way to us today untarnished and untainted. This does not mean to disregard ancient doctrines and oral traditions. In fact, just the opposite. It is the going hand in hand of both that bring these mysteries to light. And complement each other they certainly do, making it clear that our popular modern scientific logic of matter before mind is not not only brand ass new, but also the odd man out when seeing the full scope sidereal. History in general is always changing due to new findings by scholars, archaeologists, anthropologists, and so on. 
But the esoteric account of mankind's origins has stayed surprisingly consistent. Even in the face of newer and newer evidence, esoteric philosophy seems to be only strengthened by updates. When history starts over, as tends to happen from time to time known because of the Younger Dryas Cataclysm, traditional esoteric teachings seem to be unfazed and ironically even help explain the hows and whys of these very global historical resets. In other words, when the world smashes the factory reset button on our cosmic hard drive, leaving us searching for clues as to how we got here and where we are going, the esoteric stands firm, waiting patiently for us to pay a visit and lend an ear. Unfortunately, we always feel the need to explain what the esoteric is, instead of letting it explain itself to us. This hubris is clearly due to backward thinking. Backward thinking that may stem directly from our nonsensical matter-before-mind hypothesis. In other other words, if we got the first thing backwards, the rest of it is too. Perhaps backward thinking can be used to unlearn what we have been programmed to think. And so backward it is. In this episode, let's go back in time all the way back in time, as far back as our human brain will go without breaking down like Sean's Ford Escape that he insists is a good vehicle but costs more to maintain than just getting a new car. Hey, I see what you did there. That's a perfect metaphor for how textbook science works. Thank you, auxiliary left Joey. Because if it be so that mind precedes matter, especially in the origins of all things, then all things in history are also just as much the other way around. Like symbolized in Alice's entrance into Wonderland, going into an other way around universe might be the only way to see the world in a new way that expands our consciousness. Like the very consciousness spoken of above that solidifies into an entire reality. But also, like Alice's journey, the mere notion of this subject, if accidentally understood too thoroughly, can be existentially terrifying to the point of losing sleep. We'll try to keep it light. Welcome to the esoteric version of our story of the beginning, where everything we have been taught is potentially completely wrong from the get. Math doesn't start from the number one. It starts from zero. In the book Secret History of the World, Mark Booth makes an observation that is seldom contemplated but surprisingly obvious. He states simply, something must have happened before there was anything. Since there was no thing when something first happened, it is safe to say that this first happening must have been quite different from what our minds can comprehend and just as alien to our normal laws of physics. Despite being incomprehensible to a three pound human brain, it is almost obvious that it was a mental happening rather than a tangible one. Physical matter requires a source. It comes from something. Mind, however, does not seem to need a body to observe and act. The idea of mind having a real tangible effect on matter can easily be seen taking place in the placebo effect. The person's belief or thought patterns engage the person's body as a catalyst. In fact, just by moving your hand from here to here, we can see that the mind is in charge of matter and not the other way around. Perhaps we can look at the primordial first happening the same way. This original intelligence that occurs just before matter responds was considered by ancient people to be God. And well, what else would they call it? I mean, really, what else would you call it? Everything that gets described eventually consolidates down to a name. We might see a scientific experiment where little crystals take form in a solution at the bottom of a jar and be reminded of an innate intelligence that can't be seen. The snowflakes almost seem like an impulse that pokes into our dimension from an invisible one, like it's saying hello. 
An age-old allegory that illustrates this is the alchemical symbol of morning dew. This alchemical plate called Mutus Liber was created in 1677 by an anonymous author who, like the OGs and masters, did not bother to take credit for his work. The precipitation represents an emanation of the cosmic mind into the realm of matter. This symbolic concept is also found in the Kabbalah, where a divine dew falls from the hair of an ancient one and brings new life to the world while we are sleeping. Because when we slumber, we leave the tangible world and re-enter into the world of mind only where our dream state or subconscious attempts to communicate with us in order to induce changes into our waking reality. We are taught earlier than knowing better that ancient people thought the dew was literally from God himself, making them out to be primitive in thinking. A more careful look, however, shows that to be inverted as well. They understood that there are things outside of our language, no matter how wide the vocabulary. Like we talked about last episode, man cannot believe what surpasses his imagination. Likewise, an entire society's language will also be limited to our biological boundaries of perceiving reality. If we can't see a color, we don't make a word for it. Well, until technology allows us to do so. But that just proves the point. And likewise, if we don't have a word for a color, the human brain won't see it when the human eye picks it up. We have all heard that the ancient Greeks never described things as blue, and thus were not aware of it. Well, it turns out that particular aboriginals, when shown a color chart, cannot differentiate blue either until the color is defined and thus named and negated. And a border is born, not to the color, but to the perceiver. So when language fails us, we kick out metaphors that become full on allegory. Let's look at our primordial first happening this way, as stated by Booth and as captured in this 19th century depiction of the Kabbalistic image of God reflecting on himself. In this story, God reflected on himself. He looked, as it were, into an imaginary mirror and saw the future. He imagined beings very like himself. He imagined free, creative beings capable of loving so intelligently and thinking so lovingly that they could transform themselves and others of their kind in their innermost being. They could expand their minds to embrace the totality of the cosmos and and in the depths of their hearts, they could discern, too, the secrets of its subtlest workings. Putting yourself into God's position involves imagining that you are staring at your reflection in a mirror. You are willing the image of yourself you see there to come alive and take on its own independent life. Obviously, this didn't happen with a piece of glass and a silver backing, but still helps the brain capture something that can't be said. There are various ways to do this, and none of them are wrong. And likewise, none of them are accurate either. They just can't be. Words describe things, and we are talking about a time when there were not things. This is the exact reason we can stop trying to figure out which religion is right. It happens within. When it happens within over here, they talk about it happening within like this. When it happens within over here, they talk about it happening within like this. Over here, they have a desert and a sea. So the metaphors they use to describe it might involve a desert and a sea. Over here, they have a mountain and some oxen or whatever. So the metaphors they use to describe it happening might include a mountain and an ox. The mystics who coined these metaphors had the firsthand experience that led to Gnosis. So they don't bother to argue with adjacent descriptions. It is the common people who hear the metaphorical descriptions and take them for face value that lead to arguing over which mystic leaders are the correct one. And the people that have taken you and led you away from the Passover, which is ordained by the ancient times of God, are those people who come with their robes and their songs and their stained glass and say, hallelujah, isn't God great? I'm about to share something with you that's going to really uh, 
You've got a Bible in your lap, most of you. Do you know how many books are literally kept out of that Bible by the church because they were too mystical and they might be an affront to the power of the church so they were not allowed to be put in at the Council of Nicaea? You only have in your lap Bible stories that were allowed by the organization who ran things during the Dark Ages, during the Dark Ages, who ran things during the Dark Ages. And they saw Jesus Christ on the shore. And James said to John, who's that little kid waving to us? John said, who, who are you talking about? The little kid. The little kid up there waving. See that? I don't see the little kid. I see the old man. And, and as they got closer, uh, this man, Jesus Christ, helped them, and he pulled the boat in. And John said, but James saw him as very young child. And I saw him as a balding man with a beard, John said. And then I watched, and I watched, and I watched his eyes, and his eyes never blinked. Never once did he blink. And then I said, I'm going to look, and I want to see the footprints that he makes. And there wasn't any. That wasn't allowed in, in the Bible. The reason it wasn't allowed in the Bible was because James saw him as a little kid, John saw him as an old man. And what these mystics were saying to you were some people see him as Jesus Christ. Some people see him as Hare Krishna. Some people see him as Shakyamuni Buddha. Some people see him as Zoroaster. Some people see him as Muhammad. Some people see him as mind. Some people see him as energy. Some people see him as nature. Nobody sees him the same way, but it is all him who is the eternal universal consciousness of God. In this way, psychologically speaking, it is completely safe to say that a person who tells you that their religion is the one and only truth are easily the furthest from understanding what truth is. A person whose church is the one and only real church is the most ignorant to their own God. And it's no wonder they get so aggravated when Chick-fil-A messes their food order and forgets to leave off the pickles. Now their sacred chicken sandwich has been tainted by a hint of pickle juice that can't be removed by hand. And they have a damn meltdown. And then you guys pull out your phones and edit it and add music to it. And, and gosh, oh, I just love you so much. Mark Booth encourages his readers to not only stretch their imagination, but to imagine what it would feel like to see the world and its history from a point of view that is about as far away from the one that you've been taught as possible. And I really do wonder how far that can go. It doesn't take any imagination to hold the belief of today's scientific rock stars who claim that there is no use in prayer. After all, to them, the stars can only show you indifference. So the human is told to grow up and come to terms with this indifference. Yet, in the same breath, they also say that we are all made of star stuff and are perfectly cool with the concept of entanglement. Like, yo, what are we doing here? But ironically, it does take imagination to know that when you cry out, the entire universe turns to you and lends help. I'll lend witness to that. And like Booth says even better, when you approach one of life's great crossroads, the entire universe holds its breath to see what you will choose. This is not only how ancient people saw the world, but the idea of cosmic indifference never even occurred to them. The notion of cosmic indifference is brand new, but makes for a really good textbook and way super ironically also makes for a great Lovecraftian short story, but that's for a future episode. Cosmic indifference seems impossible when you realize that we are the children of this primordial first happening. We tend to take up the characteristics of victims, of orphans, failing to realize that the invisibility and ineffability of our cosmic origin is easily confused with abandonment when using only the five biological senses. This is why, as stated above, it can only happen within. And that is the very reason that Uncle Carl, despite being a master wordsmith himself, had so much trouble explaining to people that he did not have faith in God. He didn't need faith, he already knew. Did you believe in God? Oh yes, 
Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. Having faith in something is only necessary when you don't know it to be true. I don't have faith that my foot is in my shoe right now. I simply know that it is. There are things that can't be explained that in turn don't even need explaining. When we reach out and pet our itty bitty little perfect itty bitty little kiki cat, the feline knows that this response of human touch is a direct result of affection. It does not require a scientific explanation. We could break it all down and say the chemical oxytocin causes us to love the itty bitty little perfect feline philosopher, and then the contact between the two releases dopamine as a neurological reward system but now we just have word soup running in circles that kind of spoils the entire advent of petting the kiki cat the word soup has only pulled us further away from the direct experience this is why i always say that despite my love of books being great they are no substitution for direct experience they, they are only playing the role of map and compass, not to be confused with the journey itself. This should not stop us from using the tools though. Alchemical plates, Zen koans, apocryphal texts, hermetic diagrams, and Gnostic art are all indeed great tools that, like a map and compass, keep us from getting lost. This hermetic diagram is a damn time machine that brings us in touch with the great mind of Thomas Norton and his work, The Museum Hermeticum, and helps illustrate to our conscious mind what our subconscious already knows. Found heavily used in Kabbalistic and Rosicrucian literature, it walks us through so-called creation, the primary enigma that we are discussing today. So uh, let's take a little tour. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant. Because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth. There's matter. So you have time, space, matter created, a trinity of trinities there, just, you know, time is past, present, future. Space has length, width, height. Matter has solid, liquid, gas. You have a trinity of trinities created instantaneously, and the God who created them has to be outside of them. Starting at the top, we have the sensor dot representing God outside creation. The circle emanating from it is its mind that coagulates into the cosmos. The triangle also emanates from the God center as well and represents the etheric force known as the Trinity that links the two worlds of causal and physical, mind and matter. The human person, of course, is both. That's why we have Sean here in the middle. The triangle within the triangle is the soul, or as known in esoteric philosophy, ens vegetalis, the very thing that exists tethered between mind and matter, thus, as the triangle's direction points, it gives life to matter. This matter, as we have covered in a few videos now, is represented by the square or the cube that is almost always seen sitting on the ground or a checkered board floor. What is important about this diagram of the macrocosm, though, is that it doubles as a diagram of the microcosm, you. As above, so below, duck number two. Psh. Wait, are we still doing that joke in the in the new videos? In the case of the micro, the dot is the self with a cap S, the driver of the vehicle. The circle is the mind space that is personal to you only, the place where we get to choose our own thoughts that in turn project out and become our very reality by the hermetic law of cause and effect. The triangle is the vegetable dimension of the human process, something we'll talk about here in a minute. And of course, the square at the bottom is our tangible living body, and thus the biological limitations that prevent us from directly perceiving the reality at the top of this diagram, or what the top of this diagram represents. The dance between the macro and microcosms can be seen illustrated more literally in Robert Flood's sketch named, um, I'm, I'm gonna go for it. So, uh, Eutriusc Cosmi Morius Skil Eutriusque Cosmi Maoris Ciliat et 
minoris metaphysica physica at q technica historia which translates to the metaphysical, physical, and technical history of the two worlds, namely the greater and the lesser, which is also what I named my cat. But this unit comes in hot, delivering a detailed account of how the planetary spheres influence and relate to different body parts and the middle path of energy centers within us. There is, of course, a great harmony between these worlds. If we are keen with our everyday attention. When we see these diagrams, we should keep in mind that no part of it is an accident. Nothing was thrown in for the simple aspect of aesthetic. Unlike modern art, each part, no matter how minute, holds a meaning. Even this layer at the bottom serves as a foundation that holds up everything else in the chart. To me, it kind of looks like a sine wave or a vibration. This makes sense if we consider cymatics as the cornerstone of how matter precipitates from nothingness after the well-known sacred ohm or om takes place. The differences of vibration between things is what makes us all have different frequencies. The difference is what causes borders between us, the ego that causes the illusion of not being that which is outside of our skin, making it no surprise that we have this little name here hovering above the foundation. It is a necessary reality that is needed for survival in the world and, and can't be ignored. But like the chart shows, we should always keep it in its place down here at the bottom. Art like this is not limited to being drawn by ancient minds alone, by the way. We can do it too. And it's a great way to spend an afternoon. If you want to become closer to yourself, thus the concepts expressed by sacred geometry, the best way to go is to grab a compass and a square and just start creating. Look how cool this one is bad ass. There are no rules in this endeavor. You can't do it wrong. Making it in a way an active meditation. The mind before matter hypothesis that we are endorsing today is infinitely more intimate to our living self than the reversed modern consensus. Like mythology, it is a living dynamic connection to the subtlety of the most profound realities. It indicates that reality was created conditioned for the human mind to be possible and thus to do the same as its creator once did and continues to do. Do. In other words, God stepped out of his shoes to experience the destiny that is to our choosing. What better way to hit the surprise button and have an existential experience despite being all-knowing? This is quite literally what gives us the so-called free will that animals and plants do not have at their level of reality. Being mindful of cause and effect easily brings our attention to how powerful we really are at shaping the world outside of our own personal experience. Our thoughts are described as subtle when compared to gross tangible objects, but it is simultaneously the driving force of them. This is why the causal realms of the above are also described as subtle. Bob Dylan describes this unique and invisible power when he says, to do this, you've got to have power and dominion over the spirits. I had it once. Such individuals are able to see into the heart of things, the truth of things, not metaphorically either, but really see, like seeing into metal and making it melt. To see it for what it is with hard words and vicious insight. Booth notes that Dylan emphasizes that what he is saying is not a metaphor. He is directly talking about what might be described as a superpower that works through both a knowing of the world and application of the hermetic principles. Bob is referring to a powerful ancient wisdom preserved in secret for thousands of years. Whether or not he had access to these teachings directly, like Bill Murray was known to have been uh, from his Sufi teachers, oh, we don't know, and nor does it matter. He tapped in, observed the world from that point of gnosis, looked and saw the ability lying dormant within him, and woke it up. He applied it 
and absolutely changed the world with it. This is a matter of deep concentration, of course. A well-known version of this might be seen as described by the ancient Tibetans as tulpas and various shamans the world over as thought beings. They could focus the mind so sharply and deeply without any flaking of the mind that the thoughts became dense and tangible, taking on a life of their own. These living entities are called thought forms and can be sent outwardly from a human mind to complete a particular task in the world. Everyone's favorite 16th century magus, Paracelsus, wrote of an equestor, a being formed strictly from imagination that could become visible and even tangible. The thoughts would basically interweave so tightly that they would create the illusion of solid matter. And why not, considering that solid matter is also just an illusion. This should sound familiar to anyone paying attention, as it is an exact mirroring image of what we described in the intro of today's video like verbatim. It is also seen happening more instantaneously in DMT experiences. The self-transforming machine elves, as described by Terence McKenna, would sing things into existence. The items emerging from these machine elves are also alive and sentient immediately upon being born. Then they attempt to communicate with you, the observer. It has been quite a while since my monthly dips in the water and still get spine shivers and a puckered butthole just mentioning it. Perhaps we can make sense of how this happens in a practical way. Many of you are big fans of Rudolf Steiner, and I know this because of the onslaught of emails I am sent demanding that I read every single one of his six million books and lectures. Noted, thanks. But from what I have gathered, he often describes mind consolidating into matter and or happenings the same way as described by my go-tos, the priests of Egypt, as well as Pythagoras himself. The model put forward is a series of unwavering thoughts emanating from the mind, germinating seeds of change into the tangible world. It runs like this. One, pure mind when focused takes energy to produce. This is intention. Two, the emanations of thoughts become a proto matter, like our earlier notion of pre creation. Three, energy becomes increasingly dense until it is a form of matter even finer than gas. Regular viewers of this channel might know it as plasma. Four, as long as concentration remains unwavering and in full force, that plasmatic sentience will begin to gather up and clump into particles, a gas. Gravitation follows the intention of the thought form and it starts to become by using the particles within reach. If there are no particles within reach, it creates its own from nothing, as we saw in our episode Beyond the Pale, aggravating those Russian military scientists to all hell. Oh wait, you didn't see that one. Okay. Yeah. I thought we were friends, but whatever. And five. Before you know it, you have an outside force originally born from the mind that can go out and delegate on behalf of the meditator. And by the way, if that whole spiel is just a bunch of hooey to you, perhaps you would prefer that the language be tweaked just a little bit before you can be okay with it. Because everything we just described can be explained by the language of quantum mechanics. The only difference is, instead of being an outside spectator, we are actively engaged in the process itself. Perhaps that is the main difference between a scientist and a magus. Magus means wizard, John. I feel that it is important that more and more common folk learn of this art form. If this practice is kept secret to only a small group of people in the world, it is subject to becoming corrupt and used for power and greed instead of good. If we look around today, we might start to wonder exactly who it is that practices this craft and be surprised as to how quickly we find an answer to that question. We might also come to find out that this is the reason we are taught at a very early age that this very real process of reality control is called magic 
and thus associated with pure nonsense. Seems on purpose to me, but but let's reel it in. Because this transformation of mind into the material happenings of the world can be seen in the esoteric depiction of mankind's origin down to the very anatomy. The Garden of Earthly Delights is a painting by Bosch that elegantly takes us back to the late 1400s. You could smoke a baddie and be straight mystified by this solid unit for an entire afternoon. Although the Easter eggs are plentiful, the style is mesmerizing, and the onlooker is often thoroughly startled when they notice the Christ figure straight up breaking the fourth wall and gazing into your mortal soul. What we need to talk about is this thing here in the center. The esoteric tradition maintains that the first matter was finer than gas or even light, only to eventually harden into solid matter. What is more strange is the concept that some type of form of mankind was here to experience this transition. If we throw out Darwin's theory, while understanding that the biblical story of Adam and Eve is not to be taken literally, what we are left with is a gaping hole in our anatomical human history. The how and why we are built this way. Rosicrucian philosopher Jacob Bohm wrote that human bodies developed through this same process, meaning that bone was once a pink waxy material. This idea is terrifying until we can conceptualize a very different reality or environment than we are used to. A reality that is still kind of more mental than physical. A reality where consciousness is more dreamlike than thought-like. A reality where mankind is more vegetable than mammalian. And on that note, I'd like to remind you of our healthy thought experiments at the beginning of today's video to force our imagination to conceptualize a reality completely opposite of what we have been taught. Because if mind came before matter and we project reality, then that might indicate something truly boggling to the logical psyche that people in some way, shape or abstract form have been here since damn near the beginning, just like written in the deepest of esoteric and occult traditions since like forever. And so, yeah, I, I, don't, I haven't gotten to the penises yet. It's coming up. Do you want this? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, send me that one. That's good. The style of Bosch would be the way to go, by the way. His name is Hieronymus Bosch. H-I-E-R-O-N-Y. M U S. An honorable mention concerning truly cryptic art, by the way, is The Temptation of St. Anthony by Wijnen. Wij, Wijnen, I think I'm saying that right. Feel free to pause your video on this unbelievable work and just explore all the nuggets because this is the kind of painting that makes modern fine art look like the strip mall garbage that it really is. A lot of old paintings feature a form of vegetation where the human genitalia would be. This has led many to believe that it was an early form of censorship. But censorship doesn't really make sense, does it? It's a painting. They could just not paint the thing in there. And censorship is usually needed after a product is finished as a secondary response to the art. Perhaps it makes more sense that they were depicting this deeply occult theme that was much more common back then, that if the mind of man was more inwardly directed like a dream state, the anatomy of man would be very different from what it is now as well. And the last thing to form into the physical realm would be the genitals that are needed to duplicate now that we are disconnected as individual beings with borders between us. It's a very abstract notion to try to conceptualize, especially with our programming. But to try to simplify it, our mind is currently sharp and vigil because it has to be outwardly directed to stay safe from the tangible world around us that has become dangerous now that it is a separate thing. 
our anatomy follows suit, if not being the cause in the first place, as a mobile and agile vehicular figure that responds to its environment. The vegetable state of man was the suit worn before those borders cut through our reality. The vegetable state of man was the suit worn before those borders cut through our reality, when all things were merged like clumps in a web. After separated, we are subject to entropy, thus death, and then of course followed by the need to create more of what you currently are, and procreation became that tool. Sounds far-fetched, but wait a second. We can see this happening on a microcosmic scale. We can see this in person if you consider cymatics. If you have one big single layer of sand on a flat surface and then set that surface to vibrate to a frequency, the sand will separate into beautiful designs according to the pitch. Perhaps this can be seen as the primordial first cause in Fast Forward, compressed into two dimensions. The surface is the cosmic net that holds realities. The sand is the tangible matter. And the pitch, like the sacred Ohm mythology, is the intelligence or thought referred to in our mind before matter hypothesis. Think of it like this. The sand was not any less mind, so to speak, before the pitch set it into motion. In that way, all the sand has one mind, being the pitch, even after the sand separated into smaller units from the whole. The sand is us, and we are all sharing the same mind, the same ohm, the same first happening. Even though we see each other from a distance, we are all still connected by whatever invisible force it is that moves that sand by coming between it. The sand is us, and we are all sharing the same mind, the same ohm, the same first happening, even though we see each other from a distance now. We are still connected by whatever invisible force it is that moves that sand by coming between it. So uh, next time you see a painting with a damn fern covering the fun beans, tell the person you're with that their dick used to be celery. Before the technology existed for us to be able to view and learn from the cymatics, this very concept can be found in abundance in esoteric doctrines and art. In Robert Flood's Construction of the Cosmos, 1619, a sort of continuous creation is depicted. The planets and constellations are shown as spheres of influence, while God is forming and directing the cosmos and thus our individual lives. But wait, Joey, don't move on yet. We want you to keep talking about cymatics. Okay, okay. I... I will tell you what happens in my head when I see these experiments and cymatics take place. But heads up, this is probably gonna sound totally unhinged. The sand particles that represent, oh my goodness, look, no. This, I've got gray hair all over me, dude. And what do you, what's that? What are you doing? That's, oh, that's, that's gonna be, that's gonna be noisy for everyone. Do you wanna host the show? Are you, you want to read the next part or no, don't. Okay. Dude. Oh my God. You're grounded. You explain yourself to these people. Tell them, tell them why you do what you do. You let them know. He has no idea that he's a public figure. I don't think I do either. Okay. Okay. Un unhinged. That's okay. All right. Uh, the unhinged cymatics. Okay. The sand particles that represent matter keep dancing as long as the pitch is singing. If we rewind all the way back to the Hindu belief structures, we can compare the pitch to the eternal Brahma. When he sleeps, he dreams the world into existence. And when he occasionally wakes up, he ceases to dream. And the entire world also ceases to exist. Important to note that in a few books I have on the subject, it is Vishnu that dreams. So I honestly don't know which one it is now. But anywho, this reminds me of how when the pitch is stopped on the cymatics table, the sand stops dancing. It's the dream of the Brahma, the, the cymatics, the vibration that 
animates the matter. So, for example, in this 17th century depiction of Vishnu, we can clearly see how the concept relates to the morning dew of the alchemists, as this top section represents the tangible world that the godhead precipitates into. Note that the dreamer is sort of in a waters of the deep scenario here. Uh, this world is non-manifest. And not to come completely off the hinges here, but I can't help but notice that the cymatics experiment requires three things to take place. A plate, some sand, and a pitch. If this wonderful display is indeed like looking back in time to the beginning, perhaps we can relate it to the Holy Trinities found in basically all of various religions. In the Hindu trinity called Trimurti, we have the Brahma that personifies the surface. This is creation that by which anything can exist in the first place. Then Vishnu, which personifies the sand. This is preservation, the tangible matter itself. And then of course, Shiva as the pitch or frequency that separates the sand. It sets it into motion in a beautiful dance. But of course, as covered earlier, this separation leads to death and rebirth. In the Christian Trinity, the surface is the father, the sand is the son, and the frequency is the Holy Ghost. In the S'mores Trinity, the surface is the graham cracker, the sand is the chocolate bar, and the frequency is the marshmallow. Of course, all three parts of the Trinity are imbued with some invisible sentience, right? So that can be the flame that we use to melt the marshmallow. It's important to keep in mind that the Trinities always stem from a primordial one and are not parable to the top dog God himself. You might be thinking, then which part is the Reese's peanut butter cup that we add to our s'mores now? Well, I'm not gonna answer that because you're a fucking monster and are clearly of a profane and subverse intelligence if you add a Reese's to your s'mores. How messy are you trying to make this damn campsite? We're all trying to relax and have a good time and you're ruining everything with your excessive bullshit, Sean. Turn off the video and go sit somewhere else and think about your whole damn life because you are an unacceptable person who should be in jail. You need to meditate and pray or else the next thing you know, you're going to be putting peanut butter all over the place. You'll be adding peanut butter to your aunt's chili and making excuses for being ridiculous. Put the peanut butter cup down. It goes with jelly and that's it. You can't get into heaven putting peanut butter on everything. Okay? I don't make the rules here. You know what? Fuck it. Just start the song. Okay, okay, okay. Let's end this on a good note. People like to people here like to stick around for the deep and meaningful heartfelt endings. And I love that part too. Typically, as you know, I write it to kind of capture the entire subject and what it means to you, the viewer. So you can send it to your ex in an attempt to make them cry. But a lot of today's episode came from this book, The Secret History of the World. And by a lot, I mean a solid 30% of this video uh, was just reworded from this fantastic book, and I cannot recommend it enough. So in that notion, I say we close out today's episode with some words straight from Mark Booth himself. Of course, I mean, I'll be reading his words. He's not here, nor does he seem to answer emails. Come on, Mark. Mark, if you happen to be watching, you can come on the show go from having an international best-selling book to speaking to a handful of people who know better than to put peanut butter in their chili and also know better than to listen to Billy Carter. I'll even split the video's revenue with you. You know, you could make so many nickels. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Scientists are fascinated by the extraordinary series of balances between various sets of factors that has been necessary in order to make life on Earth possible. They talk in terms of balances between heat and cold, wetness and dryness, the Earth being so far from the sun and no further. At a more fundamental level, in order for matter to cohere, the forces of gravity and electromagnetism must each be of a particular degree, and so on. 
looked at from the point of view of esoteric philosophy, we can begin to see that an equally extraordinary series of balances has been necessary to make our subjective consciousness what it is to give our experience the structure that it has. By balances, I'm talking about more than having a balanced mind in a colic. Hey Siri, pronounce the word C-O-L-L-O-Q-U-I-A-L. -L -L. By balances, I'm talking about more than having a balanced mind in the colloquial sense. That is to say of having emotions which are healthy and not too strong. I'm talking of something deeper, something essential. What, for example, is needed to make possible the internal narrative, to form our basic sense of self? The answer, of course, is memory. It is only by remembering that I can identify myself. The key point is that it is a particular degree of memory that is needed, neither stronger nor weaker. Memory has to be strong enough to enable us to act without forgetting what we wanted to do, to learn without ceasing to be the same person, but it also has to be weak enough to allow us to keep moving into the future. Other balances are necessary in order for us to be able to think freely, to weave thoughts around that central sense of self. We have to be able to perceive the outside world through the senses, but it is equally important for us not to be overwhelmed by sensations which could otherwise occupy all of our mental space. Then we could neither reflect nor imagine that this balance holds is as extraordinary in its way as, for example, the fact that our planet is neither too far from nor too close to the sun. We also have the ability to move our point of consciousness around our interior life, like a cursor on a computer screen. As a result of this, we have the freedom to choose what to think about. If we did not have the right balance of attachment and detachment from our interior impulses, as well as from our perceptions of the outside world, then at this very moment, you would have no freedom to choose to take your attention away. And thus, it would not be possible for us to exercise free thought or free will. We may be required to make decisions at the great turning points of our lives. Again, it is the common, if not universal, human experience. If we work at it with a good and whole heart, if we exercise patience and humility, we can just discern the right thing to do. Just discern the right thing to do. The chosen course of action will probably require all the willpower we are capable of, perhaps for just as long as we are able to bear it. This is right at the core of what it means to experience life as a human being. There is no inevitability about our consciousness having the structure that makes possible these freedoms, these opportunities to choose to do the right thing, to grow and develop into good. Human consciousness is therefore a sort of miracle. The ancients tracked subtle changes in human consciousness with as much diligence as modern scientists track changes in the physical environment. Their account of history, with its mythical and supernatural happenings, was an account of how human consciousness evolved. Science, in this reductive mood, denies the universal human experience that life has a meaning. Some scientists even deny that the question of whether or not life has meaning is even worth asking. But. Many of the most intelligent people who have ever lived have become devotees of esoteric philosophy. I believe it may even be the case that every intelligent person has tried to find out about it at some time. This is because it is a natural human impulse to wonder if life has a meaning, and esoteric philosophy represents the richest, deepest, and most concentrated body of thought on the subject. Do it. Do it. Do it. Fall into the water. Do it. Do it. Fall into the water. 
material are here, like that. Yeah. You know, you know, I had my awakening from. Okay. Is it DMT? No, it's Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.